We're working around some ground rules that we set up in advance with our guest, Natalia Blankenstein. Natalia is Russian, but she lives in Canada. Because she's Russian, she cannot talk about what's going on in Ukraine. Because if she says anything against the war, she can go to jail. I think I've even read that if she even uses the term war, she can go to jail and there's a mandatory 15-year sentence. Natalia also cannot publicly discuss stimulant medication because you can also go to jail for having, taking, or praising stimulants as they are also criminalized in Russia. So those are our ground rules. So if you're listening and you're thinking what's happening in Ukraine right now is so important, why aren't they talking about it? Or why aren't they talking about medication? Well, that's why. And yes, I agree, it is unbelievably disheartening. On stimulant medication, it is also illegal in Japan and other countries. You know, there's a story of a young woman who I believe was American who was working in Japan. Her mother would mail her stimulant medication. This went on for years. And then one day, the Japanese police were at her door and arrested her. I believe she spent at least a month in prison. Her lawyers weren't sure that they could actually secure her release. Finally, the opinion of the guest is not representative of her employer because she works for the Canadian government. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast. ADHD for smart-ass women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 167 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I have had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. Not one. So for all these reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Natalia Bliankenstein. Oh my God, Natalia, I forgot to ask how to pronounce your name. Can you say it for me? You got it, Tracy. Okay, Bliankenstein. Uh, Natalia is a former gifted kid turned atmospheric scientist. She was a valedictorian, a national level science Olympian, a volunteer educator at a Siberian science camp, and a top student in an elite modern physics degree. All of that before she was 20. After a few years of sudden, unexplained underachievement, QADHD, she started her scientific career in a different topic on the opposite side of the world. At 27, Natalia finds herself with a master's degree from McGill University, a research position at the Flight Research Laboratory in Ottawa, Canada, and an official ADHD diagnosis. When she is not working with her flying laboratory aircraft, which, by the way, she uses to fly into crazy weather to collect data for climate research, meteorology, and satellite development. She enjoys the great Canadian outdoors with her husband and their husky dog, 
both of whom also have ADHD. Natalia is an aspiring advocate for mental health in STEM who totally wasn't going to go public just yet. But three days ago, her impulse control got the best of her, and here she is. Natalia, did I get all that right? Yes, you did, Tracy. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Absolutely. So just so our listeners know, we had a podcast guest reschedule in the last minute. And so I posted in our Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, and I asked if anyone has an interesting story that they want to share on our podcast. Natalia, I literally had, I think, more than 100 women raise their hands. Natalia was wow. one of them. <laughs> and I understand, Natalia, that this is the first time that you're speaking publicly about your ADHD diagnoses. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. I mean, like I told, maybe a few friends, a few family members and my closest colleagues, but uh -huh. I never really posted about it anywhere publicly. <laughs> so that's fun. Ah, well, this is what we do, right? This is how our ADHD brains work. So I want to hear about your ADHD diagnosis story. Can you start at the beginning? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think the, well, uh, growing up, in Russia, I really was not aware about mental health in general. Like, it's not something that people really care and talk about there. Um, so ADHD, uh, like, I didn't know what it was. Well, I, I think I heard the, um, like, the acronym a few times, um, mostly in relation to, you know, small hyperactive boys who couldn't behave. And, yeah, so that was something that definitely didn't have anything to do with me. Uh, until the pandemic started. So in 2020, when COVID uh, began and everybody switched to working from home, I was really struggling. Um, I remember I, at first I was uh, working on my kitchen table and I just couldn't put my button in the chair and do some work. So instead I would wander around, I would do the dishes, I would eat peanut butter from the jar. Um, and I just couldn't understand like what, why? Like, why couldn't I just sit down and do my work? Um, uh, a couple months later, it got even worse because I had a, a report to write for work, but instead, uh, with the time I was given, it was a few weeks when I didn't really have any other tasks, uh, I was just bin binging Netflix instead. And I did write that report, and it took me, uh, like I did it in the last two days instead of three weeks, that was kind of a wake-up call for me in a sense that there's something's going on and I don't know what it is and I probably should reach out for help. So in your bio, you mentioned that your husband is also diagnosed with ADHD? He's undiagnosed, untreated. Oh, undiagnosed. Um, he also had no idea what it was. So after I began my journey with it, we realized that he is like 100% sure that he has it too, um, but he hasn't done anything about it yet. Okay. So once you knew it was ADHD, so I'm assuming what, did you call up your, you know, your doctor and say, like, how did you even figure out what ADHD was? Because again, all you knew was the hyperactive boys climbing the walls, right? Yeah, exactly. Good question. So uh, with my problems, I went into counseling first and uh, even the counselor didn't pick up on that because we were just discussing um, you know, work-life balance and this kind of stuff. And at some point, I think on Reddit probably, I just stumbled on a story of someone with ADHD and I read it and I was like, wow, why are they writing about me? How do they know all of this stuff? <laughs> so I really started to dig in. And first I was reading and like, uh, I was really excited, really hyper-focused on it, and I was telling my husband about it all the time. So I was like, wow, imagine people with ADHD, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, so a few weeks later, I was like, oh, well, probably I have ADHD too. And I think uh, many listeners could relate that uh, the process of getting the diagnosis is really, really not ADHD-friendly. <laughs> you, you kind of have to get all of your research done, you have to find a doctor, you have to go through an assessment, blah, blah, blah. Uh, for me, it was really helpful, actually, the all of the materials that, that you, Tracy, shared with the community, like the checklist that you should do before going to the doctor. That was super helpful. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. And so it took me about oh, nine months to just get a diagnosis from a psychologist. Uh, after that, I was also able to start working with my family doctor. 
Um, but uh, I think the biggest difference was uh, just all of the research that I did on my own and uh, the books and the podcasts and everything. And that makes the biggest, biggest difference. Yeah. So, Natalia, once you knew it was ADHD and you were diagnosed and you had the benefit of hindsight, what are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about, you know, maybe when you know, starting in childhood, but now you recognize them as clearly ADHD? Uh, well, all, all of it, like all of my <laughs> life kind of suddenly makes sense. <laughs> um, so I think procrastination was the biggest one for me, you know, like binge on Netflix instead of working, um, this kind of stuff. Um, I am also very um, irritable. Um, and I can easily get overwhelmed. So I like, I just thought that I was, you know, a bit of an angry person. Apparently, no, I just got sensory issues. And whenever I get overwhelmed, I get irritable. Um, I am hyperactive. I don't think it was uh, that big of a problem. Most of the time, besides me, uh, maybe over committing to too many things at once. Um, yeah, so these are probably the main ones. Okay, so as a child, though, and even as a young adult, it sounds like you had no problems in school. You did really well in that environment. Is that true? Uh, yeah, correct. I, I'm not sure how that works, actually. Um, uh, maybe, you know, some RSD, rejection sensitive dysphoria, thrown into the mix. It kind of, you know, makes you really, really not want to fail in front of other people. So I was... Uh, really good at school about, you know, as good as it gets. Yeah. Uh, from a very young age, like, I think I started preschool when I was four and all the way until um, the last year of my undergrad, I think. I just was, you know, straight A student, pretty much. Not many people knew, though, that I would finish homework at the very last moment. I wouldn't sleep much to finish it because I couldn't just sit down and start doing it early. <laughs> Um, I also always had issues with uh, writing assignments uh, because like math and science, that was always very easy for me. I'm very much into it. But anything more of a free form writing, it was a problem. And I just couldn't start. And at the very last moment, probably the adrenaline would kick in and I would write something pretty good. Uh, even though now I understand that maybe if I had more time to actually work on those writing assignments, that would have been even better. <laughs> Absolutely. So it sounds like two things. Well, the second one I'm going to ask you about. First of all, you're clearly very, very bright. But I'm wondering, in your education, was there a lot of structure so you knew exactly what to expect and when? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I I definitely had good teachers in a, a good school. It was one of those very strict schools in a way where, first of all, uh, the admission process is uh, competitive even for even for elementary school, I think. So you kind of get good classmates as well, good level. Uh, you've got mostly um, pretty good uh, educated families. So the overall um, environment is also... Um, helping in a sense mm -hmm. and the teachers were uh, old school pretty strict uh, but with the um, you know just having a planner having the homework having all the um, tasks broken down for you having all the deadlines spaced out uh, it was definitely helping me a lot like when you have all of this it is so much easier to just focus on one thing at a time because well you're sitting in a classroom right on a yeah. particular subject, you don't really have to think about any other uh, any other activities when you are there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was definitely helping all the way through well, my school years. Yeah. You know, my son, um, well, my daughter, who's older, she was in a uh, Catholic school, and the structure was so good for her. And for my son... Once he was diagnosed with ADHD, you know, he thought, well, I need a more creative school. I need something that just allows me to just kind of go the way that I want to go, right? And what he discovered is exactly what you're saying, that it was actually the structure, because he left and he didn't do much better, right? It was the structure at the Catholic school, so he ended up going back a couple times, 
that really helped his brain because I think our brains already are not structured, right? And so we really need that, that structure to be successful. So what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. So I'm wondering, what has changed since you were diagnosed? Um, well, For you. that is a good question. So um, actually, I was wondering, maybe I should mention first about uh, when I was started struggling for the first time. Absolutely. Um, Please do. Yeah. So uh, I was doing really well in um, like all the way through high school. In high school, I was also uh, participating in science problem solving competitions of various mm -hmm. levels. Uh, that was like the best structured environment for me, actually, because um, first of all, I went to some preparation classes. So additional coursework just to um, learn how to solve more tricky problems than they would typically teach in school. But then when you get to a competition, you are given like maybe a few hours, you're given a set of problems. And I would just sit down and hyper-focus on that. Mm. And that was super, super, that was going super well. Um, so with that, I was able to get into uh, the top university uh, in Russia in uh, science. And there again, while I was taking classes, everything was going well. I was getting good grades. But I really hit the wall when I started doing my own uh, thesis research. Ah. And that is where things went kind of out of control because... Um, when you are given a, a research supervisor and they give you a problem, um, first of all, this is research, so this is not something uh, has ever done before. <laughs> so there is yeah. nowhere to ask for help, really. Mm -hmm. um, there is no structure, there is no steps on how to approach this. Uh, when you're living away for college, no one is helping you to even maintain your uh, normal daily routine while you're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. No one is telling you which particular chapters from the textbook you need to read. You're just given a list of possibly useful references that you kind of need to go through. And uh, I couldn't do any of those. I couldn't really read textbook. I'm still struggling with that. I couldn't just put in enough hours to possibly make any progress on that. Um, and with occasional deadlines, I was able to get something done. And I did write my thesis and graduate with it. But this is kind of, uh, this really got me questioning whether I was even smart. So yeah. imagine when I was graduating from high school in a, I think, graduation day interview, uh, when people were asking, like, who do you want to be when you grow up? I was like, well, I'm going to get a Nobel Prize one day. Mm. I was like 17. Now, mm. when I was 20, I was like, well, I can't even do any research at all. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to get somewhere. Um, later on, when I was doing my master's uh, in Canada, I was also like, well, maybe I want to get a PhD and become a professor. And a little after uh, struggling with a little more research problems, I was like, um, no, I'm probably not going to get there. Mm. So these um, self-esteem issues uh, that I got um, in my early 20s because of my undiagnosed country at ADHD, that is definitely something I am now fully reconsidering <laughs> now ah. that I know the diagnosis because this is now something that uh, I know, first of all, is not something that is, you know, final. Is we know, you know, brain plasticity, you know, the growth, growth mindset. So mm -hmm. uh even though I know that some some things are still more difficult for me than for uh, for an average person, there is something I can do about it, and maybe I can get some somewhere with this. Yeah, you know what, Natalia, I just absolutely love hearing that. That understanding how your brain actually works makes you realize that it's not you; it's just your brain has a different operating system, and so you just need to figure out how to work with it so you can get to where you know you should be going. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, getting a diagnosis and learning about AGGD gave me permission to do that. I'm not trying to follow how it's supposed to be, I'm not trying to uh, just, you know, push through it with brute force. Like I can't, you know, 
strong arm myself into sitting down and reading this textbook. But I could explore that maybe, um, you know, uh, if I find an audiobook on the subject, uh, then I can easily go through it while doing my dishes or something yes. like that. Yes. So can I ask you, tell me what goes on with you when you struggle to read a textbook and has it always been like this? Uh, yeah, so I have a, a very funny relationship with reading in general, mm -hmm. I think, because fiction books, I was always a bookworm. Like from early age, I read, I think, everything at home that was age appropriate and then everything that was not age appropriate. Mm. <laughs> so that was not a problem for a fiction. I can, uh, I have a bit of an opposite problem because when I start reading something interesting, I can't stop. And then everybody around me is complaining that I ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> So, but with textbook, it was always the opposite for some reason. So, uh, in school, while you were given uh, to read a, just a particular chapter, it was okay, it was doable. Also, if I search through some academic literature, searching for a particular thing, uh, that is also something I could do. But, you know, just to open a textbook and read it. I don't think I've ever done this, to be honest. I mean, I've tried plenty of times. I don't think I've ever gone through any textbook from cover to cover. I don't think and I have either. I'm surprised that they make you do that. Because in my experience, no, that, that, professors would just pick a portion, right? Exactly. I, I mean, no one was actually making me do it. And that's why I, st I was still able to get through university and everything. Because uh, pretty much all of the relevant info was told during lectures anyway. So I was just able to listen during lectures, take notes, and that was enough to pass all of the exams. But once you are getting into grad school and you're trying to do your own research, ah. that's where you kind of have to do it because there is no one doing it for you. There is no courses, no syllabus, no lecturer who could tell you all the relevant information. You kind of have to go out and search for it yourself. So do you think, Natalia, it could just be a matter of interest that you're not super interested in that particular textbook versus if there was something that you really wanted to study, you just have this, you know, this innate interest around it. Would you be able to do it then? Um, good question, actually. I'm not sure it's that because I, the research that I do now, I do have plenty of interest to it. That is like the thing that I could do for hours. I can, you know, work on my code, analyze the data and all the works. But um, maybe it's academic writing in general, because reading a journal paper in uh, any branch of science, it is uh, inherently a different text than, you know, a fiction book. Uh, it is something that is neutral in terms of emotional uh, context, right? Uh, it is very formal. Um, it does not have uh, any um, any personal touch to it in a way. So this is yeah. just the the gist of it, the gist of the uh, methods that people use to do to, to get a research problem done and the results that they got. And I uh, definitely do um, try to read research papers. Uh, I definitely, you know, cite them in my work and find some relevant excerpts, but. Even to this day, just to read a typical journal paper um, that it might take my colleagues maybe a few minutes to skim through or maybe an hour to read through carefully, it takes me a couple of work days. Mm. Because I'd start reading and then I'd, I'd zone out and I'd realize yeah. that I'm doing something else instead. <laughs> you know what it sounds like, Natalia? It sounds like those kinds of articles are just no fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, that is exactly what it is. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it is overall normal that not every part of your work that you do is fun, that some right. parts are not fun, but they still need to get done. It's just that this is a part that really uh, is not something that people can outsource, for example. Because yeah. unless you get through it yourself, you don't have a good enough understanding to take into account when you do your work. That makes so perfect this is, sense to me. Yeah, and so uh, this is something I'm still having some difficulties with. You know, I, I tried a few things to work around with it. For example, 
I could you know, uh, have a fidget toy or something to keep my hands busy and then maybe uh, I'll zone out less when I read. Or I could put some background music or a few other things. Uh, it is still nowhere near how I see other people do it though. <laughs> I know. You know what I'm thinking is what if you got on a treadmill with the book and tried to read at the same time you're on the treadmill? So at least you're moving. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. I might try that. Thank you. <laughs> it, it works for me, but not always. Okay. So your job, I want to talk about what you do. <laughs> your job is to get into a plane that's basically a laboratory and you fly into really bad weather to collect data for climate research. I need to know Yay. how bad <laughs> how bad is this awful weather that you fly into? Because this sounds very ADHD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, an example of a project that uh, my laboratory has done would be studying winter storms. So you wait for a day with a particular heavy snowfall or maybe some freezing rain, which happens here in Canada sometimes, and you fly through those clouds to take the measurements. Um, I think the hardest uh, that our facility has done, although it was many years ago, was even some hurricanes that they tried oh. to measure. So do you have an especially scary story of a time when you thought, maybe I'm not going to make it back? Uh, no, not really. Not me personally. Um, I've only been uh, there for uh, just over three years. Um, it, it does uh, get... Uh, you know, excited and funny in 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 other senses maybe because sometimes you can't really land after the flight where you were going to land and you have to go to a, a different airport uh, just to wait while the weather improves. Um, sometimes uh, you fly at an unusual time of the day because when you work with meteorologists who want you to measure a particular kind of weather system, well, no one, you know, can tell the weather when to arrive to the area where you are. So it can be flights in the middle of the night or early in the morning, uh, which is you know, not, not a typical thing that people do. <laughs> but it sounds like the reason you love it is it keeps your interest, right? It's exciting. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, uh, it kind of makes you feel a little badass when you work with the airspace. So... Uh, yeah. In, in the building that we have, the hangar with the research aircraft that we have, it's right in the same space where all the offices are. So, so you're not just, you know, uh, coming to the aircraft when you need to go fly. You are pretty much around all the day. You work with the instrumentation. You uh, prepare for the flights. You plan the missions, check the weather. Um, and... Uh, also uh, work with the engineers a lot, with the people who work with the aircraft and with the additional instrumentation that's installed on it. Uh, so this is definitely something that is very hands-on and it definitely keeps my interest comparing to um, what I was trying before uh, in terms of research area. So before that, um, early on, I tried theoretical physics where you just have, you know, pencil and paper and you sit in your desk and you try to come up with something just using your brain, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, definitely an, um, a very admirable thing that people do. Uh, it was not exciting enough, not stimulating enough for me, for sure. So now, yes, working hands-on with the aircraft, with the equipment and interacting with a lot of people for this, this is definitely very stimulating. Uh, this is definitely fun. What's also great is uh, that uh, my range of responsibilities at work is really broad. So besides just being a member of the research crew to fly this aircraft, I'm also a project manager. Um, I also support uh, my group in other areas. So I have uh, like uh, maybe two, three big projects going on at the same time mm. <laughs> that I can kind of switch between. So this is really ADHD friendly, I think, because Imagine if you were to just try to work on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. Some points it inevitably gets boring and you wander off and start doing something else. Well, here you can still do this, but instead of just doing something um, like a hobby or something on the side, you just switch from one project to another. 
So it's not only fun and exciting, but you're also interested in the actual work that you're doing. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's actually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so happy about uh, the um, field that I am in now. Um, so when I was trying to do theoretical physics um, years ago, like I had the all the proper education in terms of the coursework, so I understood what it is that people were trying to achieve there, doing their, um, you know, quantum field theory, string theory, and this kind of stuff. So if you if you took all the relevant courses, you kind of understand why it is needed. But first of all, you know that very very few people in the world understand and care about it. And also you understand that even if you achieve something, if you, even if you make a discovery or find something something important, it will only have practical effect on people's life many decades down the road. Mm. And it, it kind of makes you feel really isolated. I also think that uh, the community that does that, uh, that, does, uh, that works in theoretical physics, uh, in modern mathematics and this... Uh, very advanced um, science fields. Um, well, imagine what kind of personality you need to even go there in the first place and to succeed <laughs> there. Yeah. So you need to be a nerd. And I was definitely a nerd. Um, huh. But what I'm saying is that this is, uh, from the social point, this might not be necessarily the most enjoyable crowd. Mm. Uh, and when you've got your own, problems and you're in your own head a lot this is might not be the best environment uh, really to um thrive as a human being as a scientist mm -hmm. probably as a human being maybe not so much uh, while now um the kind of people that i work with they are from all sorts of different backgrounds and that definitely makes it a lot uh, better from the social point of view. But also because I work with the atmospheric science, so it's with the weather, climate science, it is much uh, but It's easier to explain to other people what you do. Like I can go and explain to my grandma what I do. Yeah. Isn't it exciting? And I explain <laughs> why it's important. Well, probably, you know, uh, all of the uh, debates on the about climate change, uh, especially uh, yes. in the less developed countries, let's say, uh, it, it's still a bit of a struggle, but it kind of at least uh, it's easier to imagine what you work with and to explain it to other people. And knowing the effect that the climate change is going to have uh, on the planet in the coming years, it is pretty important and it's very easy to understand why it is important. So, yeah, speaking about interests, why wouldn't I be interested in this? It's so, so cool. It is. And I can absolutely see what you're saying. It's also interesting to other people. So if you're at a cocktail party or a party, I don't know that they do cocktail parties anymore, but if you're at a party and you start talking about what you're doing, <laughs> it is, it's really interesting. It's fun. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It is. And um, it's not just, you know, the topic that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the um, opportunity to work hands-on, it's the people also. Because yeah. now being a project manager, which is not something that I could imagine um, even a few years ago that I would do, you don't just get to, you know, casually talk to people when you, we, we work with, you know, going to the office, uh, water cooler chat, not just this. You actually work towards a goal with them. And you can get your team on board to do what it is you want to achieve. And they, are all, they all agree that this is important and it should be done. And you help each other out. Um, so this teamwork aspect, I think, is also super ADHD-friendly for me. And when I was learning about ADHD, I realized that this is pretty much body doubling that I'm doing there. Yes. <laughs> I just need, didn't know what it was, but it was so helpful to me. So how did you find this work? I mean, how did you go from, you know, thinking about being a theoretical physicist with pencil and paper to this much more exciting work as an atmospheric scientist where, you know, you're in, you're in airplanes feeling like you might die every day? <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that was so random, actually. That's, you know, I think an example of uh, ADHD impulse control issues. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so uh, when I had uh, this disappointment with myself not being able to uh, succeed with theoretical physics research, um, it was really a hard time because up to that point, I was kind of so hyper focusing on just my studies uh, with a, in this particular small community. And when I realized that I just, I just can't stay there anymore, um, I quit. Uh, like, and that was a little bit out of nowhere. I remember mm. coming to my city supervisor saying that, sorry, I'm, I'm going to drop out. I, I can't do this anymore. And he was so surprised. Like he, he didn't see it coming. But yeah, so I quit and I was really lost for a little while because I didn't know what else people do in the world in general. Um, I didn't really have much hobbies or extracurricular activities or anything. You know, a typical nerd just doing <laughs> studies in a physics program in a very male-dominated field, uh, living in a dorm, pr primarily only uh, communicating with my roommates and classmates, and that was it. So, so I was lost. Imagine, you know, like you were, well, I think I was 21 maybe, and you really don't know what else to do in your life. Uh, yeah, so I, I went around asking people what they do. <laughs> Smart. Um, yeah, I had a few friends from uh, uh, from the science camp that I went to as a teenager. Um, friends working in various fields in in science and research. Um, I had a few uh, a few people I knew in the university who also did something interesting. So I went around asking. I also uh, my mom actually helped me a lot because she reminded me of the, the idea that I had at some point to uh, go abroad for school. So I just thought, well, maybe if I were to apply to grad school abroad, maybe that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. But the way I've chosen the place where I ended up was so random. Yeah. Um, I thought, well, okay, what if I want to go to a school abroad? Which country would I like to go to? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I identified a few countries. Um, then I looked up a few uh, universities in each of those figured that for that year when this was happening, I already missed the application deadlines in <laughs> most of them. Um, and uh, at some point I thought, well, Canada is a good country probably. I've never been there. I don't have, I don't know anyone living there, <laughs> yeah. but this sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just uh, remember opening uh, the Wikipedia page for Canadian universities, just the full list. There are not so many really. And then I went to the website of every one of them, found all the relevant programs that were for my education, and look at, like, looked through literally all of them. And there was only a handful that was kind of suitable and that still accepted applications for that year. So I applied to two of them, got accepted into one. Yeah, and I moved from Moscow to Montreal. <laughs> Uh, my husband came with me, but uh, besides him, like I didn't know a single person in Canada. I mm. didn't know a single person in the university I was going to. I changed major from physics to atmospheric science just because atmospheric science, well, actually it was atmospheric and oceanic science and mm. oceanography sounded fun. Uh, and then it kind of worked out. I started the program in the university uh, and it turned out to be, first of all, very interesting because when people are telling you about how weather works and how oceans work, mm -hmm. this is something that you can easily relate to. Yeah. Um, and also my previous background was uh, more than enough to understand uh, all of the uh, you know, technical details and mathematics and physics that goes into it. So it was a good fit in terms of interest uh, and um, my previous uh, experience, I think. And then my choice of the um, research project was also pretty random based on what was available, which also worked out fine for some reason. <laughs> and then this job that I found was also the only, um, the only job offer that I had after my graduation. So it's not like I, you know, I envisioned that this would be a dream work and I found it somewhere. It just kind of worked out. Well, and you said something really interesting. 
you said that you chose atmospheric science and how do you say it? Oceanographic scientist? Science? Oceanic, oceanic science or oceanic. oceanography. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oceanic science because it sounded fun, which that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my uh, previous university in Moscow, there was a small department who was working on uh, something related to uh, oceanography. And there, students would go doing field work in the Arctic on an icebreaker. Ah. And a friend of mine did that. And I was like, wow, that sounds so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you know, being from the northern country, from a northern country, moving to another northern country, this Arctic was something that was always of great interest to me. Um, yeah. And uh, I did do my uh, master's research project on something related to Arctic weather. Makes sense. So in your work and studies in science over the years, have you noticed a high number of people with ADHD or other neurodivergencies? Like maybe they weren't well, diagnosed, but you saw kind of, you know, traits? Well, of course. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what else would you expect? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Well, uh, Thinking back about my university years back in Moscow, I think it was all sorts of mental health irregularities there because to be um, really bright and to be really focused on your studies, um, even if you don't have some, some sort of problem before you end up there, you do get it while you're there. Yeah, uh, yeah, because the like the you know work life balance for students mm-hmm. in this kind of program it is non existent and the workload is insane, um, pretty much. So you see a definite overlap between you know being two e gifted and neurodivergence. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty common. Um, I think it, you know, thinking about ADHD in particular, probably. In, I, I probably don't know that many people uh, from early on in my studies. I can't really think of a particular example. And now working more in uh, aerospace, I yeah, I can see a few traits here and there. Um, mm-hmm. Also, so when I um, got my official diagnosis after a little while, I shared it with my uh, closest colleagues. And mm-hmm. one colleague of mine just responded right away, oh, me too. Uh, I'm like, wow, that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes it too. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Natalia, what are the ADHD traits that you have that you feel are responsible for your success? Um, well, the processing speed, I think. Just the fact that I'm thinking really, really fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and seeing connections everywhere, that was, I think, super helpful learning, um, going, g- getting through school and working in research now because, um, well, it is, it is important when you work in science to be able to grasp things quickly and to uh, mm-hmm. build on what you already know. So that is definitely helpful. And that's kind of... <sighs> I think that's probably the only trait that is kind of, you know, inherently in DHT. But there are a few other things that probably developed as uh, as a coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. So greed, resilience, keeping at it despite anything. Um, yeah, so that is one nice side effect. Risk-taking. You know, like yeah. moving to another country where you don't know anyone and you're like 21, 22 uh-huh. um, and changing the field. And uh, it, it does take some sort of um, craziness to do that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, I, should also, I should also mention that when I started my job here in Ottawa, that was also a bit crazy because uh, I was living in Montreal at the time. And it's like two cities in Canada that are two-hour drive apart. So I had a two-hour drive commute. Mm. And it's it's not like commute, you know, from a far suburb to a downtown of a city or anything. 
it's like you're literally driving from one city to another through on a highway through a forest mm. in, in, in Canadian winter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still unsure how I was doing this now looking back at it, but I was commuting like this for nine months. Well, and was it two hours each way? Yep. Oy. So four hours a day you were on the road. Yep. Thankfully, I didn't need to go uh, to office every day. So I would go maybe three days a week or sometimes I would go and stay for a few days in Ottawa, just renting an Airbnb room. Mm. Yeah, but like this is something that y- you need a particular sort of craziness to even agree <laughs> to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so that is probably another trait. Um, and I think um, now that I'm going through this journey, learning about my ADHD, it also really helps develop some compassion yeah. for other people's struggle because a, in my childhood, when I was so successful in school, I was probably a little arrogant. Mm. I'm not proud of it. Yeah, <laughs> like, like no, when I get you, this. When you are smart and you are having a hard time explaining things to other people because they just can't follow you quickly enough. Right. Can't follow what you're saying. It can kind of make you a bit arrogant. Mm. Um, and, but now that I went through some struggles myself, I am really trying, first of all, to pay attention to how other people behave and to yeah. maybe notice if someone may need some help. And I try to uh, talk about it as well, because I'm hoping that, first of all, if I tell people that I'm having difficulties, uh, there is more chances that I'll get help. And also there is more chances that they will feel comfortable sharing when they are struggling. And there's so much less shame, too, because they see you, who has always been, at least from outward appearances, so successful, right? So, well, if Natalia can go through this, then anybody can. And still be very successful at what she's doing. Yeah, I know. The the, the shame component of it, it's... I, I don't think we talk about it enough in the ADHD community. I mean, we, we do mention it often and that it is present, but I, I rarely hear anyone talking about what to do with it, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, that's something that I actually wanted to bring up when talking with you because um, I know many people will listen to this. Um, I know that probably many people can relate to my story because, well, we, all of us with ADHD somewhat alike, so uh, I'm happy if that's the case. But there is one thing that um, I either don't recall any of your guests mentioning, or maybe only a few times. So what was super helpful for me was uh, reading the works of Brene Brown. Yeah. Yes. About shame and Talk vulnerability. And, yeah. And I, I know that Brene Brown, is she's not an ADHD expert. Uh, she's like, what she's um, working on, when she, what she's speaking about and writing books about is not... Um, something specific to neurodivergent folks, but she writes about vulnerability and shame and leadership a lot. And um, it is definitely helpful to me uh, as an ADHD person because um, I think it gave me a vocabulary to talk about it. You know, like when you're learning about ADHD, sometimes uh, you learn about executive functions, and emotional regulation and mm-hmm. this kind of stuff. And it's like the puzzle suddenly makes sense because these are the things that you sort of kind of understood all along intuitively, but you just didn't have the words to describe it. Yeah. And it, it was exactly like this for me with Brené Brown's books because the emotions and the um, social aspects that she's writing about, they're kind of familiar Definitely all of us went through it, but having a vocabulary to be able to describe what it is exactly that is happening here, that was such a huge help. I love that. And I think part of the problem is that even in the DSM, emotion isn't mentioned at all. But certainly if you talk to ADHD women, because that's who we talk to, that's what they always bring up. So... I, I've often said that, you know, I've heard enough of Brene Brown's stories. I love her work as well that I'm like, I think she's ADHD. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so thought funny. about it too. So yeah. funny. 
Okay, so give us one of your best ADHD workarounds. Ooh, um, can I give three? Sure, give three. Okay, so I have, let me uh, tell one thing that works for me really well, one thing that works for me most of the time, and one thing that I'm kind of still exploring. So the thing that works for me all the time is um, a smart way of multitasking. So uh, it's just pretty much a way to regular, uh, regulate the stimulation level so that it helps you focus on what it is you need to do. And the way I'm doing it is when I need to listen to something, I really need to keep my hands busy at the same time. Oh. So, uh, you know, full disclosure right now, I'm talking to you and I'm sewing something here. Wait, what <laughs> so are you doing? Have... You're sewing? Yep. Oh, it's okay. like like uh, a little rag rug or something. So n not something that uh, takes a lot of my attention because I can do it pretty much mindlessly, but I do need to keep my hands busy and my eyes busy while I talk to you so that I don't lose my train of thoughts and I don't turn out that much. Um, or the opposite example would be um, if I uh, need to get something done just with my hands, you know, do the dishes, do the cleaning, tidy them up, then I need an audiobook or a podcast to listen to to keep my brain entertained while I'm doing this. Yep. So this is something I use all the time. Um, another thing that is super helpful is Focus Mate. If there is anyone out there in the community who hasn't tried it yet, please do. It helps. Yeah. And we have our own Focus Mate group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. So yeah, 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 I'm in there. It's it's yeah. super, super nice. And uh, it's it's also cool that uh, the you can see the badges um, when people are in this group. Like you can see it in their profile. And so anytime I'm matched with uh, a woman from the group, I'm just so excited that you know I can actually um, um, share my struggles in the sense that uh, like I'm working on something, for example, and I got distracted. And at the end of the session, we are checking in how how the session went, and I can say that. Um, yeah, I got distracted and I, I was doing something else and I feel less shame than when saying it to a neurotypical person. Yeah. So explain what folks made is because some people might not know. Sure. So it, it's an online uh, service for body doubling or virtual co-working. Um, you can um, book sessions. There is an option for either 25 or 55 minute sessions where the, you get matched with a random person. And this is a video call. Um, where in the beginning you can greet each other and state your goal for the sessions. Then everybody is doing their own thing for the duration of the session and you check in at the end to see how it, go how it went. So uh, the, the way it helps to me is that, first of all, it really helps to start the thing that you need to get done mm -hmm. because you scheduled it for a particular time, even if you just scheduled it a couple of minutes ahead. <laughs> still like there is another person waiting there for you so it gives you the, the accountability to show up and to get started also it helps to kind of verbalize what your task is and to maybe break it down into smaller chunks uh, because once you have a better idea of what is the particular first step that you need to do it also helps defeat the procrastination so that was Foxmate. And there is one more thing that I'd like to mention that I personally am still working on. Uh, that would be um, training on task management slash time management slash energy management. Um, in a sense that, so I, I've been doing it for a couple of years now, you know, trying different types of applications for to-do lists, different types of systems. Um, I'm still figuring out how to set it up exactly so it works for myself. But the piece that was super helpful is just the understanding how to, um, for example, break down a task into manageable chunks, how to identify the next immediate step uh, to advance on a project, how to defer a task. So whenever there is something new that gets dropped on you, you you really don't have to drop everything else and start doing this. It can wait out there in the corner <laughs> and you'll get back to it when you have time. So all of these things, this is not something that I learned in school because school was structured and school was easy. 
But in the real world here, when you are trying to live as a fully functioning adult and you hold down a job, um, it is not obvious, but once you uh, learn even just the concepts, it is so much easier to organize your work and not to be overwhelmed by it all the time. So do you have a resource that you learn some of this task management through? Uh, well, I think I started with the GTD system. It's Getting Things Done oh, by David okay. Allen. Uh, it is kind of an old school one, and it also might um, seem very rigid to some ADHD folks. I'm definitely not following it, it you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the explanation of how to, um, you know, do things or delegate things or defer things or break down a task, identify the next step on the project. So the concepts are there, they're well explained. Uh, the, the exact way the author uh, proposes to, to do it might not really suit you that well, but it's a starting point. Got it. Got it. And yes, I mean, the breaking things down is so important. I can't even begin to tell you how many months I had build a website on my to-do list. <laughs> and that does nothing for positive emotion if day after day, week mm -hmm. after week, you see that, right? Because it was so big, I didn't even know where to start. So I completely agree with you on that. We call it a brain download over here, just getting all that stuff in your, you know, in your mind out of it, and then picking the goals and building tasks from that one small goal, you know, for the week. So I completely I completely agree with you. It's really changed how I plan. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it, it's not just, you know, the brain down, because first of all, you need to upload all of the thoughts that you have floating in your head yeah. on a sheet of paper or you know, in some sort of storage so it doesn't crowd your mind. But even that is, that's not enough to get uh, them done, right? Because then no. you need to take each particular thing that is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you've got a pile of, Paper is around you. You need to look at what, at each particular thing and decide what to do with it. Uh, whether it's something that you don't have to act on and then you can just throw it away or you can file it for future reference or whether it's something that you can delegate or you can uh, you, you have to, do, to act on it but you don't have to act right now or um, this is something that really sounds more like a project, you know, build a website. Uh, so it needs to be breaking down and once you identify the particular next action to do, that is your starting point. Absolutely. So Natalia, before we go, is there anything else that I've missed asking about that you'd like to share? Well, one thing actually my, just that I maybe wanted to, to explain is, uh, yeah, so the, the way I ended up being on the show with you today is it was really random. Uh -huh. uh, this is not something that I was going to do because, as I said, I, I didn't really share publicly about my ADHD diagnosis that much. But I was trying, I think, be more open about my mental health in general, at least with the people close to me, because I believe it's important to create the space for people to talk about it. I was in so much shame going through my struggles. Um, several years ago and in the beginning of my ADHD journey. And now uh, I'm thinking, like, what if I knew earlier what ADHD was? What if mm -hmm. I knew some people who could explain to me what it was or who could at least mention it so that I knew it existed? Uh, and it seems super important for me to, to speak about it and to have this public conversation that you are definitely creating here with your show, Tracy. So thank you for this. Um, but for me, it was a bit of a problem. I didn't know how to really start this broader conversation. So yeah, I can talk to the people close to me, um, but I didn't really feel comfortable, um, you know, posting it about it on social media, for example, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of all the stigma that exists around this, because of uh, people who don't understand what it is and because of the shaming and blaming that can happen sometimes. So um, when you post it on, on the group that you were looking for, for for a regular member of the Facebook group to to maybe show up on the on the podcast and talk to you. I thought that 
Well, I mean, first of all, this is definitely fun because I, you know, I've listened to, I've been through all of the episodes of your show <laughs> while learning about the GG. So yeah, the, like, I, I mean, I love the show. I love the Facebook group. So uh, yeah, wh why, do, why wouldn't I want to be here? But also, this is such a great chance to start this public conversation with among the folks who already have a very good idea about what a DHD is, and there is le less chance of this, you know, backlash. Yeah. So I'm really thankful that I have this opportunity today, and I really encourage maybe other listeners who uh, are in a similar position to use this as an opportunity to use the Facebook group and the show. Well, thank you. You are just an absolute delight. Um, sorry, Alexa is, Alexa, stop. She, she, you know, she announces the next appointments 10 minutes before just to make sure that I actually show up. So thank you, Natalia, so much for spending time with us here today. You are such a delight. So if people want to connect with you, where would they be able to do that? Would they be able to do that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, uh, in a helping profession, and it's not like I have my own business, right. so uh, like I don't have a website or anything like that, but I have a Facebook profile um, that uh, I'll, I'll be happy to um, to talk to people, um, and I also have a professional profile on LinkedIn, uh, where people can reach out to me if they're um, if they have any particular questions about maybe the universities I went to or my current job. Uh, yeah, so feel free to reach out. Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is I'll get that from you and then we will, uh, we'll put that all in the show notes. Yep. Sounds good. Well, it's just my first name and last name. Exactly. That's as it's both here on the show. Uh, I'm easy to find. My last name is pretty much, there is no other people with this last name. <laughs> Leonkenstein. Okay. Yep. So Natalia, thank you again. And that is what I have for you for this week. So if you like this episode with Natalia, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews really help. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK -okay system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.